The Douglas Skyhawk is a legend. It's had a very long lifetime, beginning in 1954. Around the world, that life is continuing, and examples will still be providing small nations with combat-capable air power beyond the turn of the century. Though they now verge on the antique, Skyhawks continue to be maintained and refurbished. They're still agile and venomous. The predominant thrust of aviation design since World War II has been for planes to become larger and more complex, to the point where some types have been virtually unmaintainable. The Douglas Company's designer, Ed Heinemann, was a man who understood this trend in aviation design and was deeply concerned about it. Not only were planes becoming expensive, they were becoming unmanageably big and complex. Operational costs multiplied in line with construction costs. Also, there were huge investments in training that were often lost, as these skills were in demand outside the armed services. Adding to this brain drain was the constant need to retrain personnel to keep abreast of technology. Heinemann was convinced there was no underlying need for this expensive trend. Certainly, some roles like air superiority fighter demanded a very high degree of performance and capability. But there's little to be gained from that kind of performance in a battlefield observation aircraft. Heinemann wanted to design a family of lightweight and low-cost workhorses. He was aware of the difficulties the US Navy was having in getting useful jet aircraft to operate from its carriers. His humble little workhorse went on to a career that shows up some other very famous aircraft. Heinemann was right in most of his assertions. To a certain extent, the pursuit of low cost and lightweight harmed the aircraft in its initial form. But the airframe was an extraordinary success. Within that design, the problems caused by excesses of cost cutting were rectified. And by the mid-1960s, the A4's career appeared to be almost infinite. There were bumper stickers that read, A4 forever. Not only did a surprising number know what the message meant, most agreed. In January 1952, in a meeting at the Pentagon, Ed Heinemann outlined a concept for a lightweight carrier-based interceptor. There was no Navy need for such a plane, but the force of his argument applied equally to the role of jet-powered light attack bomber. By the time the meeting was over, Heinemann had agreed to produce a working concept for such a plane. As the design was developed, a constant exchange between engineers and service representatives settled the parameters the aircraft would have to meet. On the 21st of June 1952, the US Navy formally issued a contract for production of prototype aircraft, designated A4D, with some very rigid specifications. The agreement described a lightweight, single-engined, single-place, high-performance carrier-based day attack plane. It was to be capable of performing dive bombing, interdiction, and close support missions. It would be capable of carrying either conventional or nuclear stores. The mission of these planes would be to strike sea or land targets with or without fighter protection. Prime objectives included simplicity of design, leading to ease of manufacture and maintenance. The aircraft would have a maximum speed of 500 miles an hour. It would have to be able to carry a 2,000 pound bomb load over a 460 mile radius. 
most important, the aircraft would have to cost less than one million dollars each. In the end, the requirements were all exceeded, and the first 500 aircraft averaged a cost of only $860,000. By October 1953, the A4D design had been fully evaluated and while the prototypes were being built, orders for 19 production models had been placed. Confidence in the soundness of the little plane was growing rapidly. Not only was the Navy becoming more convinced of the A4D's excellence, but world events were giving a new urgency to the need for them. The developing Cold War carried with it a growing certainty of nuclear conflict. The US Navy had a theoretical role as a prominent part of America's atomic capacity, but in reality was ill-equipped for the task. Its North American Savage bombers were of limited use, and of the designs available, only the Skyhawks seemed to have the necessary capacity. For a while, the impetus behind the plane became the tactical nuclear need. Fortunately, the nuclear consideration did not come to dominate the design. Far from a single-purpose plane, the Skyhawk emerged as a very versatile light attack aircraft. Central to the capacity of the plane were Ed Heinemann's philosophies. The plane was kept as simple as possible, with the nature of a particular mission, not the overriding consideration. For the future, the design could be changed or added to as new missions arose. The plane should be constructed in sections that could be easily disassembled for maintenance. To avoid weight, entire systems were deleted. By squeezing the plane down in size, it was small enough to fit on carrier lifts, which eliminated the weight and complexity of folding wings. By having the undercarriage retract forward, the need for a backup hydraulic system was eliminated. If the system failed, gravity and airflow would lower the wheel and force it into the down position. At no time, however, did the search for weight control interfere with the strength of the airframe. In fact, the aircraft was all the more rugged as a result of the process. The short-span delta wings could be constructed simply, but with enormous strength as one unit. There was no need for complex folding mechanisms. The wing was available for fuel storage and provided accommodation for 560 gallons. This allowed further savings in the weight of fuel valves and pipes. Two years and one day after the first formal contract, on the 22nd of June 1954, the first A4D took its first flight, and the serious work of testing began. Instead of the normal limited prototype evaluations, there were soon 11 aircraft busily conducting the 1500 flights of the test program. The Navy was anxious to have the new plane as soon as possible for inclusion in its arsenal. A series of orders had now been placed which had defined the expected shape of US carrier attack aircraft. There would be three aircraft types to cover the entire range of specialties. First of these was another Douglas plane, the A3D Sky Warrior. This was such a successful design that the USAF bought a variation as the B-66. It had an internal bomb bay for atomic weapons, bombs or mines. Subsonic, with a range of over 1,000 miles and a 12,000 pound bomb load, it was, at the time, easily the biggest plane that had been designed for carrier use. Its role in Navy attack would be as the long-range, nuclear-capable strategic bomber. Design of the A3D began in 1947, and it first flew in October of 1952. After satisfactory testing, it went into full-scale production. In 1954, Ed Heinemann received the Collier Trophy for his work on the Sky Warrior in recognition of the excellence of its design.
The second specialist was the Grumman Tracker, designed for long, slow, anti-submarine patrolling. The Tracker combined the functions of search and attack in its large frame. It was elaborately equipped for its specific task. Between these two roles, strategic bomber and anti-sub patrol, there's a very wide gap. The task of the A-4 was to fill this gap. Another Douglas Classic, a redoubtable AD, was doing the job at the time. Despite its phenomenal lifting power, long range and indestructible ruggedness, the AD was seen as a piston-powered dinosaur that needed replacement. Perhaps the Navy's only disappointment with the A-4 was that it never did actually replace the AD. The two planes ended up complementing each other right through to the Vietnam War. Skyhawk testing dissolved quickly into active service. The early models showed some undesirable side effects of the cost controls. There were problems in the simplified instrument panel and the need for special ground equipment. Everything that could be eliminated from takeoff weight had been, to the point of a non-electrical starting system and the replacement of seat belts with a harness on the pilot. Some of these innovations were effective, but others proved to be highly impractical. However, this was exactly what the busy testing program and early deployment were designed to establish. As deficiencies were identified or clever suggestions made, they were all noted and the plane began its long process of refinement. In addition to aircraft, Ed Heinemann is famous for a large number of other developments. Quite a few of his refinements were either designed for the Skyhawk or were incorporated into it at some stage. Among them were innovations in the bomb racks, in-flight refueling, the streamlining of store shapes and a continuing refinement of ejection systems. The initial ejection mechanism for the Skyhawk weighed less than half the standard equipment of the day. Later, Heinemann's team would refine ejection to a system which worked safely with the aircraft stationary on the ground. This became standard on later Skyhawks. His contribution to aviation is enormous. Of course, an engineer or designer can only be as innovative as his employers will allow. And Heinemann's career can also be seen as a testimonial to the courage and vision of the Douglas Company. The company was richly rewarded for its support was one of the most successful aviation companies of all time because of its capacity to gamble on development. Sadly, the gambling eventually destroyed the firm when it became overextended in its fleet of jet airliners. By the time this happened, it had written a huge amount of aviation history. The A4D1 quickly gave way to the A4D2, which incorporated a number of changes to overcome problems in the original air. From that point, variant Skyhawks would multiply. With retrofitting of improvements to older airframes and the continuing process of development leading to new types and further retrofitting and specialist subtypes, there came to be no standard Skyhawk. This was compounded by the unexpectedly long life of the individual airframes. The A4D2 first flew in 1956, with 28% of the structure altered. In 1958 came the next model. Even before that first flight, another two versions had been developed and dropped, and a fresh major variation was being prepared. It would fly for the first time in 1961. On the 18th of September 1962, all American Armed Services adopted a new method of aircraft designation. After deliberation, the A4D family became the A4 family. Variants would now be specified by suffix letters. The A4D1 became the A4A, 
and so on. The A4D designation was skipped to avoid adding additional confusion. By then, there were four models in operation with a range of refurbished variants wearing other standards of equipment. The Navy had long wanted a twin-seater, but had been unable to convince Congress of the need. Navy submissions asserted that a twin-seat A4 would be ideal for advanced training, navigational training, in-type training, and some combat requirements, but to no avail. Eventually, the course of history intervened. The Vietnam War broke out, and the need was acknowledged. If nothing else, a trainer would release combat-prepared single-seaters for conflict. In 1964, approval was given for construction of a twin-seat TA-4E version. In addition to 28 inches of fuselage added to allow for the second seat, several other improvements were tried out in the prototypes. Soon after, most of these were being busily retrofitted to airframes in the now considerable A-4 fleet or built into planes under construction. Among these were the newly finalized zero-height ejection, wing spoilers, and a steerable nose wheel. The twin seaters were developed from the A4E model, which had been refined because of a basic shift in policy away from reliance on the nuclear deterrent. The US had been confronted by the Soviet Union, but now, there were myriad small uprisings around the globe. These were sponsored by the Soviets, but they were not arenas for nuclear weaponry. Iron bombs and guns were not as out of date as had been believed. The A4E resulted from efforts to enhance the conventional capability of the already very flexible Skyhawk. Entering service in 1962, a new model and the further spate of refurbished predecessors which followed it were on hand for the challenge that arose. From the Gulf of Tonkin incidents onwards, the A-4 became part of the heroism and horror of the Vietnam War. pilots loved them. For a start, this plane was fun to fly. It was demanding and wouldn't fly itself, but it was fast and aerobatic. In addition, it was small and not easy to hit. If it was hit, it could generally be relied on to continue flying, even if the damage was major. It could be pulled around viciously without the wings coming off. It could be flown as low as your confidence allowed. It could be as accurate as your training made you. It was as sophisticated as a mission demanded. But beyond that, it was always as good as its pilot was capable of. The targets were difficult, and the pilots knew that despite their heavy losses, no other plane would have survived so well. Meanwhile, the Douglas Company was trying to capitalize further on the successful little plane by securing overseas orders. In the course of sales campaigns, the Skyhawks demonstrated their ability to operate from the small decks of Canadian and French carriers. However, 
Despite successful demonstrations, Douglas secured very few foreign sales for carrier A4s. The offer developed for Canada led Douglas on a long search to find a buyer for a re-engined NATO variant. For a variety of reasons, a succession of decisions went against the Douglas sales drive. Few countries operate carriers, and some, like France, have their own fairly aggressive aircraft manufacturers. With this and other factors to contend against, the foreign sales efforts were only occasionally successful. The first sales were to Argentina, refurbished US Navy B models for their Air Force in 1965, and later orders for the Argentine Navy's carrier. The first sales of new aircraft were to the Australian Navy in 1967. Given that the Australians only had one carrier in operation, that order was small, 10 aircraft, including two twin-seaters. When the full order was ready, the Australians sailed their carrier into San Diego and picked the planes up. The Australian Navy managed to lose almost half their Skyhawks in operational accidents and eventually withdrew them from carrier service before abandoning their carrier altogether. Their aircraft included some specialised fitting to what was basically the A4F model. The plane's equipment had an emphasis on air defence which set them apart from their mainstream US counterparts. Another customer was New Zealand. They didn't have a carrier, but the New Zealanders could spot a bargain. They're still refurbishing and maintaining their Skyhawks, and are also negotiating to buy up more airframes. Like Singapore and Israel, they've reveled in the performance and durability of the plane. They've seen the advantage of keeping them available and updated as potent specialist weapons in any modern context. Delivery of the New Zealand aircraft began in 1970, and the planes have been in the front line of that nation's strike force ever since. With purchases made to supplement their fleet, it's likely that New Zealand will be one of the countries still employing the A4 past the year 2000. Other countries to have bought the A4 are Indonesia, Kuwait, Malaysia, Singapore and Israel. The aircraft of Kuwait, Argentina and Israel have all seen active combat with mixed results. The Iraqi assault overwhelmed the Kuwaiti forces and the Argentinians sent their planes on virtual suicide missions against the British in the Falklands. The Israelis with a larger, better trained air force and a balanced mix of aircraft types found the A4s well and flexibly suited to their needs. Only the USA has operated A4s in combat from carriers. The Skyhawks bore the brunt of the US Navy offensive against North Vietnam until 1968. Then they were replaced on the larger carriers by A7s. The A4s continued in action operating from the older carriers and with the Marines right through to the end of US involvement. Targets for the carrier A4s attacking the north abounded. In the attempt to freeze the transport system, bridges and other key points were identified, and the Skyhawks missions followed. The Vietnamese network was under constant surveillance, and as often as repairs were affected, the raiders could return. Later in the war, this attention was spread to other major infrastructure, including power stations. The A4s flew strike missions against targets that were obvious key points and therefore well defended. They also flew ground support attack missions which tended to expose the aircraft to concentrations of ground fire. Because they were there all through the conflict and flew such a large percentage of combat missions, 
it's not surprising that more A4s were lost in Southeast Asia than any other carrier-based type. They accounted for nearly 37% of Navy combat losses and 36% for Marine losses. A total of 266 Skyhawks were lost in combat. The Skyhawk, despite all the improvements, was still a very small and light aircraft. The empty weight of the E model was only 9,853 pounds. Fully loaded, they could haul 8,200 pounds of external stores, though they often flew with much smaller loads, particularly with the Marines operating from inadequate runways ashore. The key to using the planes effectively was in-flight refueling. Heinemann's dictum was that the plane should take off and then what is necessary for the mission added. The plane itself should remain as basic and flexible as possible. Lessening the amount of fuel carried at takeoff allows a greater arms capacity. Takeoff and climbing to height uses a considerable percentage of fuel storage available. And to keep the store's pylons free of external tanks as much as possible, refueling after climbing to height helps a great deal. But Heinemann was unimpressed when it was suggested that the A-4 be developed as a tanker aircraft to do the refueling. To him, there were two problems in the Navy order. In the first place, to cram drogues and pumps and fuel lines into the Skyhawk would turn it into a specialist plane. Secondly, the size of the A-4 was itself a problem. There would be great difficulty in fitting the equipment in. The answer was to not fit the system into the plane but rather bolt it to the outside of the standard model. With typical ingenuity, the Douglas team designed a streamlined 300-gallon refueling tank which could be suspended from the bomb rack hard points. The tanks were designed to operate independently of the aircraft's power sources. The propeller at the front of the tank provided the power that drove the pumps and operated the fuel line reel. These self-contained refueling packages became known as buddy stores and are another example of the innovation and lateral thinking of the Douglas team. With a centerline mounted buddy store in place, an A4 could transfer all the tanker's external fuel and half the internal storage. This totaled 1,300 gallons and made the operation well worth the effort. It provided a multiplying factor on the available power and range of carrier-based air strikes. They were used extensively, not only to refuel other Skywalks. The buddy stores also found their way onto other aircraft types, turning them into tankers just as effectively. The Skyhawks had served the Navy well, but because of their limited load and other considerations, a decision was made to replace them with the new A-7s, which could carry roughly twice the load. However, the A-7 Corsairs were only adapted to the large carriers, as they were over twice the size of the Skyhawks. While the A-7 was an excellent aircraft, there were many who questioned the wisdom of abandoning the A-4s, which were obviously still more than capable of their tasks. However, the decision had been made in 1963, and the phasing out of the A-4 from Navy duties commenced at the height of the war, progressively restricting their operations to ships that were too small to use the Corsairs. Not only were there voices in the Navy questioning the decision to replace the Skyhawks, there were voices in the Marines which flatly refused to accept the Corsair. As far as the Marines were concerned, the A-7 was unable to operate effectively on the rough, short forward airstrips. They cost too much and were equipped with mission capability that had nothing to do with the job in hand. Thus, the Corsair was of no interest to the service. An A-4 would drop the last Marine bomb of the Vietnam conflict. The Marines were pleased with their Skyhawks and considered that the little planes were more than coping with the tasks allocated to them. They decided to stick with the plane, 
but now that they had their preferences, they ordered several improvements. A 20% more powerful engine was the first change, along with such improvements as greater ammunition storage, self-contained starting, a larger windscreen and canopy, and a drag chute to reduce landing length. The new model was designated the A4M. The authority to proceed with the project was given in May 1969 and 11 months later, on the 10th of April 1970, test pilot Walt Smith flew the new model for the first time. A distinctive change to the look of the plane was the squaring off of the tail to incorporate IFF equipment. The Marines introduced the A4M to service in 1971 and bought 160 of them. Eight years later, the last of these was delivered. It was the last A4 made. The Marines were not the only ones to stick to the Skyhawk. The Blue Angels Navy display team was another enthusiastic A4 user. They flew the Skyhawk for 13 years, from 1974 until 1987. Ironically, by the time they started using the little plane, the Navy had stopped buying them. The last Navy single-seater had been delivered long before, in 1967. A full 20 years later, the Blue Angels finally parted with their beloved A4s. The initial decision to transfer the Blue Angels to the Skyhawk was made on economic grounds. They required far less maintenance and burned far less fuel than their predecessor, the F-4 Phantom. The display pilots soon came to appreciate that here was a plane that was also far better suited to their work. What they lost in speed in comparison to the Phantoms was more than compensated for by the maneuverability of the A-4, a tight turning radius high thrust to weight ratio and the roll rate of 720 degrees per second made the Skyhawk a natural aerobatic aircraft. One Skyhawk virtue emphasized during their service with the Blue Angels was the low number of man hours needed to maintain them. The display team could go on a two-week tour of air shows with a maintenance crew of only 27 to service the seven A4s and the transport Hercules. With this small backup crew, the team flew about 80 shows a year. This was in a design that was 22 years old when they first started using it, and 35 years old when replaced by FA-18 Hornets. The Blue Angels planes had an uprated engine and everything not needed for their performance was deleted. The dorsal hump full of avionics that had spread across the Skyhawk fleet was removed, along with the armaments and bomb racks. The planes were returned to a lean and clean condition and the pilots found them a pleasure to fly. For men trained in a higher technology environment, the A-4 was a real eye-opener. Its small size, powerful responsiveness and maneuverability introduced them to a simpler age, where they found to their delight that the possibilities were more exciting. At air shows around the world, audiences came to appreciate this fact too. The rugged simplicity of the Skyhawk's construction was the factor that served to keep the weight and cost down in the original plans. In addition, it had the effect of lengthening the plane's lifespan. For example, Douglas had been contracted to guarantee a life of 4,000 hours for the wings. Experiments conducted on the wing during the Vietnam War showed a surprising result. Factoring in the excessive strain of combat loadings as established in Vietnam, tests showed that the wing was good for 15,000 hours, even if all those hours were flown at maximum combat stress levels. In normal use, the wing was virtually indestructible. The plane might have been simply constructed, but that simplicity 
hid an enormous amount of redundant strength. This not only made them last longer, but explained why they were taking so much damage and remaining in the air. It's also one of the factors which helped to explain the continued affection of the Marines for the Skyhawk. The Marines A4M was a surprise package, even for those already convinced by the Skyhawk. Its new power plant gave 20% more power, but weighed only 1% more. In addition, there was no significant rise in fuel consumption. This greatly increased available power for marine operations from short fields. For the first time, the A4s could be safely operated from 4,000 foot runways. The new engine developed 11,200 pounds of thrust and allowed an increase in maneuverability, rate of climb and acceleration, greatly enhancing combat survival chances. Empty, the A4M weighed only 10,600 pounds. Fully loaded, it was capable of takeoff at 25,500 pounds, including 9,100 pounds of all types of modern tactical armament. It was still only 40 feet long, and its wingspan a tiny 27 feet. As with other Skyhawks, its dimensions permitted it to operate comfortably on carriers without folding its wings. The original Skyhawk had three store stations, but with strengthening of the wing from the E model onwards, this was increased to five. Another factor served to multiply this arrangement's effectiveness. Multiple carriage bomb racks were conceived by Navy and Marine personnel working at the Naval Air Facility at China Lake. After assessment at the Naval Ordnance Test Center, the design came to Douglas, where it was refined and put into manufacture. Subsequently, these racks were to be very important to the success of the Skyhawks in Vietnam. They allowed for six 250-pound bombs to be carried on the wing stations, with a further six 500-pound bombs on the center line. In addition, the planes could launch any of a range of rockets and missiles of varying sophistication. The M model gave the Marines what they'd wanted in ground attack and close support and made quite an impression. Indeed, so noticeable was the new version that Israel, which had already been flying the A-4 since 1966, decided to buy a quantity for its own use. The Israeli planes were closely modeled on the Marines' new plane. Among the few changes were an improved navigation and attack system and revised cockpit design, including a head-up display. The built-in starter was also deleted. One of the aspects of the M model which had caught Israeli attention was demonstrated in a series of time-to-height trials which were conducted with the plane. These were designed to demonstrate the swift response capability of the aircraft and its usefulness in area defensive work. In the tests, the plane was parked at an angle to the main Palmdale runway, engine off, to simulate an alert condition. With a time clock running, the test pilot, Walter Smith, used the self-starter on the plane to get the engine going and then taxi the plane directly into its takeoff run. engine off and parked to 3,000 meters, nearly 10,000 feet, in less than two minutes. The trials conducted in August 1972 were a complete success. The little plane passed the 3,000 meter mark in one minute, 50 seconds, 
and continued on to pass 5,000 meters in less than two and a half minutes. Demonstrations like this served to emphasize the fact that the new engine had given the redoubtable bantamweight a new potency. On the face of things, this was a 20-year-old design which should not have been still a contender. In reality, its longevity was one of the things that ensured its competitiveness. There were no bugs left to iron out. The plane's already good handling had been markedly improved, and its attack remained as powerful as the ordnance bolted to it. The Israelis had extensive combat experience with the Skyhawk in the 1970 and 73 wars and were well aware of the plane's virtues and vices. Their reaction to the upgraded power of the M model was to purchase 120 of their own version, the A4N. This first flew on the 8th of June, 1972. To further emphasize the changes in the plane, the Douglas marketers distinguished the M and N models as the Skyhawk II. Despite their best efforts and the merits of their product, there was to be only one further sale of new aircraft. This was to Kuwait, and their version has been cited as the most refined Skyhawk of all. That contract was approved in 1975. Though the fact would not be confirmed for another couple of years, the end of the production line was now in sight. American military aircraft, the end of production has been quickly followed by the phasing out of the type. With the durability of the individual Skyhawk airframes and their capacity for absorbing new avionics and new functions, they've taken a very long time to disappear even from US service. One of their long-standing roles is with the US Navy's Top Gun School, more correctly known as the Navy Fighter Weapons School. Here their small size and agility gave them employment in simulated combat as opponent aircraft, mimicking the performance of Russian jets and the tactical training of their pilots. In many ways, they're ideal opponents for the new high-tech aircraft. In many places around the globe, the likely opposition will be older Soviet designs, as was the situation in Vietnam. Hopefully, unlike the situation at the outbreak of that combat, US airmen will already know how to take advantage of their enemy's weaknesses and deal with their strengths. The learning curve in Vietnam proved to be a costly exercise. Top Gun training has hopefully made such expensively sobering moments a thing of the past. A4s have also served into the 90s with the US in other roles. The trainer version is still going strong, although its replacement has been developed. The Marines have remodeled some for forward air control work. More surprisingly, there are programs in train to once again rebuild Skyhawks to frontline status. In Singapore, there's an ambitious remanufacturing effort which involves upgrading power on the plane by a staggering 35%. With the sophistication of modern engines, this actually involves a 14% reduction in fuel consumption. A more powerful Skyhawk that is even cheaper to run is a very attractive proposition. The 2000th A4 was delivered on the 10th of July, 1967. The last was handed over on the 27th of February, 1979. In the end, 2,960 were built in a continuous production run that went for 26 years. In all, there have been 17 different models. The total was made up of 2,405 attack bombers and 555 trainers. If you measure a plane by how well it does its job, 
the Skyhawk presents a problem. It did many jobs. Then again, it did them all well. The Skyhawk series will be part of the world aviation scene for the coming decades. In the year 2002, it will be a 50-year-old design, but still going strong. It is assured of a highly regarded place in aviation history. It deserves the recognition for its success, and further, for the effect it has had on subsequent developments. Some would argue that, in fact, it has not had as much impact as the lessons it taught warranted. Ed Heinemann once described the A-4 as just an honest, low-cost attack aeroplane that did better than it was intended. There are two ways to read this statement. Either Heinemann had very high expectations, or he had a remarkable gift for understatement.